this is where I was so stupid. I had never worked in real estate before. Why did I think it wasn't going to be the exact same cycle as every other job I've had? <laughs> I didn't set aside any money for taxes on purpose. I, I, I knew I knew exactly what I was doing. I was so optimistic that I was going to work well with my brother-in-law. And it just, it just wasn't, it didn't click as much as I thought it would. We were great friends. Working together did not really work out as well as I thought. So uh, my name is Max Baumore. I am currently based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and what money means to me, I, I think more than uh, a means to buying things and stuff, it, it's kind of a, a means to living life in the way that, that is comfortable and enjoyable and fulfilling uh, for me and my family. And, and I think that that understanding of that appreciation for money has uh, developed over time. Uh, I think a decade ago, I think I would, I would more associate money with the, uh, with buying things and, and being able to show people what my, you know, socioeconomic status is and fast forward, uh, 10 years, uh, a marriage, a kid, a mortgage, a dog too. I don't want to forget my dog. Uh, my, my appreciation for appreciation for money is both more serious and, and weighty. And I understand the the value and the, the risk associated with it, but also uh, the things that I want to do with it are more associated with uh, experiences and, and, and life and living and less about, uh, you know, what people who see me think I make or something like that. Perfect. Great. Awesome. Um, so what you're saying is with, with time, with age, you have matured and uh, at least in your mind, you have started to, see the real value of money, that it can be an enabler for you to live a more richer life, more fulfilling life, right? Rather than just trying to live in the moment and trying to um, just showcase to the world or impress others, right? It, it is more about how you can leverage it to lead a more fulfilling life. Exactly. Uh, precisely, actually. Couldn't say it better. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So uh, you did tell about your current situation, but when you talk about uh, earlier, 10 years ago, when uh, in your own words, you were not so mature related to money. Are you talking about your college life? Yeah, I guess I would say just after. So I'm, I'm 31 years old. So I guess I graduated school nine years ago. So let's let's say instead of 10, let's say nine or eight, eight years ago. That's, that's a little more accurate. A decade feels feels like such a, a good uh, barometer of time. But uh, no, I, I think in college, I was as typical as as uh, and comfortable with with what I was doing, I don't I don't look at college and say, "Wow, I made a bunch of money mistakes." I didn't have any money. I spent my money on on beer and you know, weekends with friends and, and things like that, and, and flying home and, and things like that. So I I don't have any any regrets about the way I treated money in, in college uh, because there wasn't enough of it to make big decisions. Um, but then af after college, I I kind of had a a six or seven or eight years of, or I guess six or seven years of a pretty typical trajectory. I, I had a job right out of college that I, I actually got the job based on my internship the summer before college. Uh, so I, I moved to New York City from Washington, D.C., where I went to school. And I, I worked for a couple of years at this entry level job uh, that was on paper and, you know, for all practical purposes, a, a great job. It's a, it's a great opportunity at a, you know, S&P 500 or Fortune 500 company. And, um, it, it was, it was a cool experience. I, I didn't, I didn't expect to love it, but I, I, um, it was a job for a couple of years. And then, uh, I, I did that two more times. I, I bounced around to a couple other jobs where I had this, this mindset that, um, you know, basically as I should say, I consider myself smart enough to, uh, to get by in any job for a couple of years based on the fact that it's new and it's something different. And that, that, that pattern repeated itself three times. My first job, the first year it was like, Oh, this is cool. It's a, it's a, it's a job. I'm an adult. I live in New York city. And then for the second year of the job, I was, I was thinking, this is not that much fun. It's pretty repetitive. I spent a lot of time putting things into PowerPoints and Excel decks and or, or Excel spreadsheets and, and not really getting anything out of it. Uh, and so then I, I had the opportunity to interview at a startup company and I thought, oh, this is cool. It's technology, it's digital, it's, it's, um, it's exciting. And that's exactly how it felt for the first year. And then the exact same, uh, kind of trajectory happened where 
it stopped being cool. It started just being annoying and there was busy work and you're, you're not quite entry level, but you're not quite making decisions either. So you're, you're, you're in this, this middle ground and, you know, just three or four years out of college, you start seeing people who, who have landed somewhere that really clicked and they start, you know, they're 25 and they're managing people or they're, they're 26 or 27 and they're directors and you're a, an account manager or a junior strategist or something. And so you, you're, you're looking around and you're like, something's, something's not right. I know I'm smart. I know I work hard. I don't work that hard, but I know I can work hard is kind of the, <laughs> the, the crux there. Um, but some, but it's not, this is not it. I'm not, I'm not excelling the way I want to. I'm when I sit down on my computer, do work. I don't want to do it. I know I'm paid to do it, but I don't want to do it. And I'm not really getting, when I do do it, I'm not really getting any, any back end benefit at like, you know, financially. Yeah. Like I, I worked in commission roles. So there's, there's financial back end, but there's no fulfillment back end. It's like the company hit the, hit the goal for the quarter or you hit your commission goal or, or your quota or whatever. And then you just do it again and you do it again. And I, I wasn't really, I, you know, identifying with the products I was, I was selling. So it, it just, it felt a little empty. And so I had an opportunity to move to another company. It was a step up. It was a, a company that was also, it was advertising technology. It was digital. It was, you know, front, um, you know, front of the industry. Uh, and I had the exact same experience where the first year was amazing. We were in this office with, you know, food and catered lunch and, and coffee on tap and beer in the fridge. And they took us to California and we would go out with clients and it was just fun. And then COVID happened. So what I didn't realize until, you know, midway through 2020 is that the job wasn't fun. The other stuff was fun. And that was exactly <laughs> why they had the other stuff there. They were, they were geniuses. And so I'm sitting there, you know, at, at, a, at a coffee table, sharing a coffee table with my wife. And we'd be like, do you have a call? And everyone did this. This is not a novel thing. Do you have a call at 11? No, I have a call. All right. Can you go in the bathroom for your call? I'll take my call from the. And so, so, so the job remained, but the fun stuff went yeah, really it, forward, right? Precisely. <laughs> and, and so you, you realize like, oh, wait a second, I don't like this job. And this was even, this wasn't even a full year into it because at the other jobs, it took a full year. But, but, but at this job, because COVID interrupted that first year, we lost the perks and the fun very quickly. And, and so we were I was just like, oh, I don't love this. But also we're in the middle of a pandemic. What am I going to do? Everyone's afraid that their jobs are going to go away. We don't know what's going to happen in the world. There was an election. It was, all, it was just, you know, everything was crazy. And then my wife found out she was pregnant. And so, you know, leaving... Did that force you to hold on to the job because of I think uncertainty a, and why being pregnant? I think a little bit, but I, but I think at the same time, I also didn't know... I didn't know what I know now in the sense that I thought that I just... A, I, a, I didn't know how long COVID was going to last. So if we got back into the office in September of 2020, I probably would still be at that job. But we didn't go back to the office till September of 2021. And so, but I, I thought I was still in the headspace of like, oh, I want to work. I want to work in corporate America. I want to have a cool corporate job. I want to get promoted. I want to have people report to me. I want to be a VP. But this is just not the right job. That's that's kind of what I kept thinking. It is not the right job. Then my wife got pregnant. And what that actually did, it didn't do anything about my job, but it was, we were living in a one bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, which was fantastic. It's, it, was, it, was a, it was a great size apartment for my wife and I and our dog. And we both left the apartment every morning to go to our work, our jobs in Manhattan, and then we'd come back to Brooklyn. But once we found out we were pregnant, well, there was two steps. The first step is everyone tells you, oh, guess you got to move. You can't, nobody can raise a kid in a one bedroom apartment. And our, our kind of defense mechanism kicked in we're like well no we'll show you we're going to raise a kid in a one-bedroom apartment and then we had our son in november of 2020 and by april of 2020 we were moving into our new house our new condo in philly uh because we were not doing a great job of of managing uh the amount of bodies that were in that apartment uh in 600 square feet in the middle of COVID where we would have to put our, our masks on to get the elevator to go down to walk the, the kid outside. It was, yeah. Was, was it really that or uh, you wanted a room where baby can cry and you can still be? 
at least one of you can yeah, see it in your sleep. There's that too. Well, and it was it's really attractive when you know we were paying we were paying thirty one hundred dollars a month in rent in our in our apartment in Brooklyn, and that we felt like that was a great deal. There were people that were it, not like that was super cheap, but it was a nice place and it was a good deal. Um, we bought our condo in, in in Philly when rates were very low, and so our mortgage for 15, 1600 square feet here and two bedrooms and a massive living area and a beautiful kitchen was $2,000, including the HOA. So just the cost of living shrank dramatically. And because everyone was still remote because of COVID, I know it, everyone, a ton of people did this. So this isn't novel either, but we were still making our Manhattan salaries, but we were living in Philadelphia and paying our Philadelphia mortgage paying Philadelphia groceries, Philadelphia, like we, you know, we, we weren't really spending any money. So it became a, a two pronged, well, three pronged, I should say. Number one was the space. Like you said, um, my son has his own room where he was sleeping next to our bed in Brooklyn. Number two was the finances. It's, it was way cheaper. It was almost, it was almost like we, we weren't getting the benefits of New York during COVID, which a lot of, a lot of people experienced. So it was, it was hard to justify the costs, And and we looked, we looked at two bedrooms in Brooklyn and, and it was just, you know, $4,500 a month for a two bedroom, $3,500 if it was a two bedroom that was gross and we didn't really want to live in. Um, and then, but the third reason to, to move to Philly was that my wife's family lives here. So it was, you know, the family support, um, which obviously also helps. Yeah, yeah, exact. So, so then we moved here in, in April of 2021 and then... Uh, at this point I'm, I'm still, you know, working in my job. I've had a couple, a couple, one or two month stints of paternity leave. So I'm, I'm less miserable because I got to get paid and not work for several weeks, uh, which, which was great. Um, and it's invaluable time, you know, bonding with, with my son. Uh, but then June of 2021 rolls around and my wife's boss decides that they're going to go back to the office. And she ends up getting laid off because we did not live in New York anymore. And so her boss made the decision that, well, if you're not in New York, you can't work for us. So uh, basically without any warning, she got let go. Um, and she got, and then, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you think that that was the only reason? Uh, because frankly, uh, it, it's the unfortunate truth of corporate America with that with she being with a very small infant, Right, uh, some companies may just just think that she is not no longer as valuable to them, or as available to them. Right, it's not right, but that happens. So I'm just thinking, uh, what you guys feel is it was COVID or back to office the only reason? Because other companies were a bit flexible; they allowed time to their employees to sort of adjust to the new schedule. So that's a very fair question. I think it was probably a number of factors, but I don't think I don't think that was a factor. It it, it was um. She worked at a family foundation, um, which had a lot of money. Like, uh, it wasn't a corporation. It was, it was, her job was to help them give away millions of dollars a year. And she was good at it. Um, I think it was more, they, she didn't always see eye to eye with the, um, the CEO and he was very rule oriented. So he made this decision and maybe it had nothing to do with how he felt about her, but he made a decision that everyone needed to be back in the office and he just he drew a line. He said goodbye, and he cut cut strings. So I, I think it could have been multiple things, but we never, okay, we never felt like, oh, this is fishy. It, it, it was annoying, and my wife didn't feel good about it, but it, it didn't feel inappropriate. I guess okay. I should say, okay, but okay. but definitely so now the, you're down one job in the family. Yeah, exactly. So um, she, she got a pretty a pretty good severance package, fortunately, um, but so. We're down to one job, summer of 2021. I'm working. Basically, I've decided this is another thing that happened. When we moved to Philly, you, I, when you live in New York, you kind of feel like you're in the center of the world and, and you you have, there's some, there's some kind of importance that's put on your life because you live in New York City. Uh, it's completely fabricated and, and we're totally self-entitled and full of ourselves, but I felt I felt very cool living in New York City. Uh, we moved to Philly, and and it's you don't have any of that. You, there's a lot of great things about Philly, but it's not it's not New York, and it doesn't you don't have that 
grit. You don't feel like, oh, there's a thousand celebrities around. There's a thousand Broadway shows. It's the coolest place to be. And so I think because of losing that intense importance and like self uh, actualization that New York kind of gives you, even if it's a little false, I started realizing I need to do something else that makes me feel like I'm fulfilling this kind of itch I have to be in the center of a, of a kind of an artistic or cultural or creative place, which, which New York gives you. And when I was a kid, I did a lot of acting. I was in plays and did music and did singing and things like that, but I hadn't done it for my entire twenties essentially. And so we moved down to Philly and I, this was in the, this was independent of losing my wife, losing her job. I basically was like, I, I'm going to start looking for an acting class. I want to, I want to get back into acting. Um, I had stumbled into an improv class in New York before COVID that probably started kind of churning those wheels again, but, uh, I wanted I wanted to get back into acting. So I looked, I, I started taking an acting class when I moved to Philly and I immediately, I immediately started kind of auditioning for different things like commercials and short student films, things like that. And it became very clear to me right away oh, this is something I need in my life. This is, this is no longer, this is not optional. This is something I need in my life. And my, I, kind of my, my script flipped in my head. It, it, I was like, before I was, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with, with my job and my career and, and, and how I wanted to continue moving that. And I was, I was a little bit frustrated with the, with the amount of money. I was, the raise I got for my, I got promoted in April of 2021 also. So I was a little frustrated with the promotion there. And so it, this is all happening simultaneously. I get promoted. I decide I could make more money elsewhere. I'm I'm working at a very, very in-demand company. So I'm getting recruiters reaching out all the time. And and I like to entertain that. Like, well, how much do I make? 150? You said 175? You said 225? You said 250 OTE? Like, wow, these are big numbers. It was twice what I was making at, at I was at a company called The Trade Desk. It was, it was a fantastic company of like a, a ton of reasons why it does well. Um, but, but I, I thought I could make more money. And so I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm having conversations with these recruiters and, and, and kind of listening to what they have to say and imagining what life would be like if I made double the money I made. Same time, laterally, my wife's losing her job. Same time, laterally, I'm, I'm getting involved into in an extracurricular activity that is really giving me energy in life, which is the acting stuff. And so I almost accepted a job that would have paid me twice as much money, would have required that I go up to New York two days a week or something, but they knew I lived in Philly. It, it, it didn't, it wasn't a, a, a negative thing. They were like, yeah, just come up on the train a couple days a week, go to client meetings, you know, take clients out for drinks, whatever, take Amtrak back. No problem. They'd pay for it. It was, it was no, you know, no skin off their teeth. And um, I I made the decision that I think this was my first transition into a different mindset of like what I wanted my life to look like, uh, and transparently it was it was a unilateral decision. This was this was like me making the choice that I don't know if this is for me, and I said you know I'm gonna I'm gonna turn down. My wife was never like you need to take these jobs at all. I I just she she was. Kind of, kind of asking, well, is this going to be more of the same? Like, is this going to be six months where you're stoked and having a great time and you make all this money and then you're going to be trying to do the same thing in, in a year? And I said, yes, I think it is. I think it is going to be that exact same situation. And I don't think I'm willing to work hard enough to earn that, you know, 250K OTE or whatever it was. I, I don't think I have the interest and I don't think I don't have the skill set off the bat, which if I had the interest, I am confident I can gain the skill set. But I said, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. I'm going to be in the exact same position a year from now. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I turned down the job and I just kind of kept working. And, and then right at the same time, she gets laid off. And, and so we're kind of just chugging along. It's the middle of summer, 2021. You know, she's not getting any traction with new jobs. Cause again, it's the middle of summer. Um, and then starting in the fall, she starts to get some traction on, on new jobs, uh, where she gets, you know, second, third, fourth round interviews. 
she's interviewing a lot, working full time, or sorry, basically job hunting full time, and also parenting full time because um, we we had a part time nanny, but uh, she spent a lot of a lot of her time also take care taking care of our son. Um, he wouldn't start daycare until uh, the following spring, so she's working full time, taking care of our son full time, basically, and I decide. I have a loose conversation with her about it, but I basically decide I, I, I have two things in my head. I say, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to work at this job anymore. I have a solution. I, I don't want to work at the shop. I want to, I want to pursue acting more seriously and I have a solution on how to make that work. And my solution was that my brother-in-law has been working in real estate for a decade and I could join his real estate team. So I could, you know, everyone knows about real estate agents. There's, you don't work nine to five, you work all the time. Uh, but I was like, I can, I can work, I can make money because I know I'll hustle. I know I'm good enough about it. I, this is where I was so stupid. I had never worked in real estate before. Why did I think it wasn't going to be the exact same cycle as every other job I've had? <laughs> I said, I can hustle. I can make, I'll probably make a hundred grand the first year, 200 grand the second year, and it'll be you know, sky's the limit from there. I'll have flexibility. I can pick up our son from school every day at 3 p.m. I can do acting jobs whenever I want. I Nobody will be telling me what to do or where or when to do it. It'll be perfect. That was the first thing so, I had. So so you looked at all the good things, all possibly what all, all can go right. Did you even care to look at any, any risk associated with it or what could go wrong or not at that time? No, not at that time. I think I have one of those, I, I guess a lot of people have this brain, where I'm really good at, at knowing why it will work. I'm so good at knowing why it will work. And my brain works this way even when it comes out of like cooking a recipe or, or cooking dinner. I am so confident that it's going to work. But also, I will eat a weird tasting mash glob of gross food. I don't care. So I'm I have this high level of confidence, but also I, I am very prepared to to kind of grovel in whatever failure of mine and still be happy with it. So that works really well when you're a single guy. It doesn't work so well when you have a family. So I presumed I was going to be completely successful. I was like, there's no way this can't work. I have, I am so, ta I'm, you know, I was so full of myself. I was like, I'm so talented. I can figure this out. Now, now that you have more experience, do you know how many real estate agents in the U.S. actually make a full-time income doing real estate? I think it's some <laughs> tiny percent. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, like, like it's less than 5% of the real estate yeah. agents. So 95% of them, they all come in thinking exactly the same things as you did. It, how hard can it be? I can talk to people. I have friends. People like it. And yeah, I, I have bought a house or I have done some dealings. Like you said, I have a friend, brother-in-law. Right. But once you get into it, you realize that like everything else, it's not easy to make money. Yeah. But and, and, but in, interesting. Hmm. And I, I also had the added audacity to think not only am I am I going to be successful at it, but I'm going to stop working every day at 3 p.m. to go get my son. And I'm going to I'm going to a lot of the time be auditioning and going on doing acting stuff instead of cold call. So not only did I have unrealistic expectations, if I were to give it my all. I didn't give it my all. I I, I gave it you never seventy-five. Planned, you didn't even plan to give it your all. No, I right? had no I had no intention of giving it my all. <laughs> this is how yeah. ridiculous I was. Is that I was so confident that I could casually do it. I could just float on by, and that was incredibly incredible. Such incredible um, shot in Freud. Right, that's the word. Where like I I just I had no uh, understanding of, of any possibility that it could go wrong. I also fully believed because my wife is brilliant and talented and is very, very marketable. This was in, I think October, September when I made of 2021, when I made this, this choice, I was so confident. So basically what I did was I, I told my boss one day, my boss was like, all right, let's talk about your future. And I just said, I don't think I'm going to have a future here. And that's, and so I, I quit my job with a, one, two, th with a three and a half month lead time. I was like, I don't think I have a, this is the weirdest thing I've ever, this is very, I don't recommend this at all. 
I told them I was going to quit my job in and they February, in February of 2022. But this was in October of 21. I was like, I don't want to talk about planning for 2022 because I don't want to work here long term. And that was very weird because then I spent three months basically offboarding. But if they wanted, if they they could have fired me right then and there, but I was so this is again my my cockiness and my my self-importance was so so strong that I was so everyone who was like, well, can't they just fire you? If you say you don't want to work there anymore, why would they not keep you there? And I was so confident and I was right about this. I was like, well, I was half right. I said, not only are they not going to fire me, I think they might pay me extra to stay until February. I think they're going to be, they're so, they need me so much that they're not going to fire me. And they're going to, and I'm going to say, hey, I could leave right now, but I want, I'm willing to stay till February if you guys will give me some sort of severance. Well, they, they, that was not even a, a, a brief blip of a possibility. They were like, you can leave now, you can leave in February, or whatever, but we're, we're not paying you. That's ridiculous. I was like, okay, all right, fair. But I was right that they weren't going to fire me because I was valuable enough, you know, going into the holidays, I knew I wasn't, I wasn't the kind of employee that was, uh, you know, scheduling cross-functional meetings to drive our product forward while trying to figure out the best ways to dive into the client's needs analysis and create value for, for next quarter and beyond. I wasn't that guy because I, I didn't care about the job. But what I was, was extremely competent in, you know, managing and handling uh, client deliverables and having phone calls with clients and, you know, doing internal stuff. Like I, I was good enough at keeping the ball rolling where we wanted it to that there was there was no real reason to fire me because it would just have created headache for them and I wasn't it's not like I was going to a competitor so there was no risk in in keeping me I think I, this is just my so so again uh, your employer did that because it suited them right but look at it from your perspective you have a family your wife has lost her job you have a young kid at home, right? And you still don't have a next plan about where the next paycheck would come from if you leave this job. But you still went ahead and told your company that I'm leaving, right? Whatever time, lead time and whatever. But you made that call, right? Again, yeah, thinking it, in your mind, probably it'll work out, right? It was so, incredibly stupid. <laughs> yeah, I would have to agree with you there, right? Stupid and irresponsible. Yeah, yeah, and I, that I and the 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 second piece, I thought I had all these fail safes because the 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 first piece was that I told the whole thing that I just told you that I told them. The second piece in my head was that my wife is so smart and so she's so um, she has such good experience that she's gonna have a job before then, no problem. She's in she was in like three or four different late round interview stages, and I was like, she's got it in the bag. Of course, we're gonna have income. Uh, obviously. You can tell where I'm going with this. She did not have a job by February 2022. So not only am I, um, you know, quitting my job, uh, she doesn't have a job. I, it's not like I have real estate deals lined up to close. But the most important thing here is that we went from having health insurance or free. My employer paid my all of our premiums. Went from having health insurance for free to paying going on the exchange and paying like it was like 1100 bucks a month to your nose. Mm -hmm. yeah to cover insurance and, and the it, with no the, income the, right with no well with no income and this is this is a little bit of a of a kicker is that this is my other insurance uh, not insurance health insurance but my other fail safe is that um i had about $120,000 in equity from my company. I I have pitched my wife on a lot of kind of dubious financial things. Okay. At, at one point, which based on talking to me, you could probably picture. Uh, at one point, I in, in early 2021, I was studying for the LSAT and I thought, I want to make a difference. I'm going to go to law school. And I did all the math. I was like, I have about 100K in equity. If I go to Temple University Law School in Philadelphia, which is, if we live in Philly, that's in-state tuition. If I sell my equity, I can cover the cost of law school. 
I was like, done. This is great. This is my next life. This is my next step. I, I took the LSAT. I was like, nah, I don't want to go to law school. No, <laughs> I'm not, not going to happen. Uh, but I already had this in my head that I have this chunk of money that can, that can propel us into what, what life we want. And so in January of 2022, I'm about to quit my job. And one of my, one of my friends from college is in Philly for work and asked me if I want to go grab dinner and we're, we're having dinner and I'm, I'm pitching him on my plan. I'm going to sell my equity. I'm quitting my job. I'm going to sell my equity. I'm going to do real estate and acting. And Kara's going to get a job. My wife's going to get a job and we're going to like, we're going to be in easy street. Like it's going to be, there's a, a lot of, a lot of the dominoes have to fall at the right time. But if they do, I got off scot-free. I, this is fantastic. And what he said, he said, whoa, don't sell your equity. He had a lot of equity in his company. He's like, never sell your equity. Use it as a line of credit. Like take out a line of credit on your equity. And I was like, well, if I sell 100K of, of stock, which is almost exclusively profit because it was an employee stock purchasing plan, I think it was about a, a 20K basis. So like I, I would have been paying taxes on $80,000. Well, that takes a huge chunk out of what I, what I have. And so I said, this is, I went back to my wife and I was like, I think we could do it a better way. We'll use the liquidity access line on my, on my equity and we'll just pull out little bits at a time because you were using like a checking account, just like a HELOC or anything. Use like a checking account. So we, if we only, if we, if we only need a thousand dollars next month, we only take a thousand dollars. We only need 500 bucks. It's great. I pitched, I, I am really good. And this is a problem that I'm working on is I'm really good at having these incredibly optimistic feelings and then pitching them to people as though, of course, everyone should have this same optimism. And uh, my wife is supportive of me and, and sees how much I believe in this stuff. And so she, she tried, she trusts me. She trusts me that I have the best interests of our family in, at heart, which I, I do in one capacity. I just, I don't realize how I'm blinded or, or I don't want to why did it is a passive thing? It is actively my fault. Yeah, you, you are passionate about it. You are excited about the possibilities. And that kind of leads you to, on for, like you use the word blinded, but you do get your blinders on, whereby you can only see what could go right and not see all the other things that can go wrong, right? So that happens. Uh, now, in, in terms of your credit line, right, what your friend said was a suggestion that instead of selling equity, you can borrow against equity. And you're right that for others who are watching this, probably uh, parallel with HELOC may make more sense because they, they know what is that, right? Uh, borrowing against the house. Uh, but you did something similar, borrowing against your equity. It is an option. And for a financially savvy individual, actually, it's it's a good option. Not for everyone. Because, it, again, it comes with a lot of risk. But for somebody who is financially savvy, for them, it makes sense that don't pay taxes, borrow, and effectively use it. But as with any other uh, credit line that you use, credit card, mortgage, any loan, a lock, or this, what is very important is what is your purpose of taking this? Like any anything that you're taking on credit, any money that you're taking on credit, if, if the use, what you're going to use that for, and the only... If, if you want one single golden rule about when it is okay to borrow, there is only one rule that you can only borrow if you are going to use this money to create some appreciating asset. If you are going to, right? So mortgage does that. You are going to buy a house which is likely going to appreciate. And it's a low risk investment. Right? You can always borrow and buy Bitcoin. That's not an advisable because it's not guaranteed to appreciate. It can appreciate, it can go down. So risk is very high. But if it is an appreciating asset with a manageable amount of risk, that's the only situation you should borrow, uh, right? And so you establish this line of credit. But did you think about uh, for what you were going to use this money? Was it for living expenses or was it for something else like paying for college? That also is an example of the right investment if you think you will pay for college and then that will in turn give you a lot of returns. You'll get a high paying Increase job. Your and income. that can be an idea. Yeah. Right? So what were you thinking that what will you use this expense, this line of credit for? 
So this goes back to my, you know, blind uh, confidence is that I didn't think we would use it. I thought, I thought, I mean, when I first was figuring it out, I was, I, I thought, oh, she'll have a job. And then I thought, oh, well, I guess you won't have a job, but we have enough in savings that it's just going to be a, a what if, like a, a, a you know, a, a third or fourth option. And then I started thinking, okay, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll take out a couple thousand dollars for the first couple of months. And then I'll, my, my deals will start rolling in. She'll have a job and we'll stop using it. Fast forward to, to a few months later when we had 20, 25, 30 K of the, of the liquidity access line used, that's a terrible reason to use it. It should not be for, for living expenses, but it, it turned out it, it was because then once, once she got a job that then it's kind of like, you know, I had a couple of deals that came through. Um, but then you're, you're not really covering your expenses. You're just paying down your debt. And so it's like, you know, oh, we have 10 K this month and now 8 K and then next month I didn't have a deal. So now it's back up to 13 K and then she gets a job. So now we're, we're not really adding that much to it. And then well, to, to fast forward even further, then she got laid off from that job, not for any fault of her own. The company went under it, like it, it was, it was, it was completely been, yeah. terrible luck. Yeah. But so it, it went from a fail safe, a bit safety net. That, that was a plan. Yeah, it went from a safety net to, to, to the, to the main, you know, way we were able to pay our expenses. Um, and that was, that was not intentional, but it was not unforeseeable. It was, it was something I very much should have recognized was a very real possibility. And instead I thought it was an impossibility. Right. And then, so, um, you realize like, that that's what it ended up happening. And that's a big red flag when you, uh, start spending that money for your living expenses or for things which were, uh, which should not have, you should not use credit for. The, the problem with such easy access of line of credit is it's it's your own money in some sense, right? Be it a HELOC or a line of liquidity that you had. It's your own money. And one, because it's your own money, there is no stopping you. You can have easy access to it, right? And the terms are very favorable if you look at it from that perspective. Like, it's very easy to access it. You can decide when to pay back a little later and all that, right? The flexibility that it offers you, it actually works against an individual because it makes it simply too easy to access that money. So I also had one more question. Uh, if you look at those months when you were almost exclusively living off this line of liquidity, uh, think about that and tell me what, what was your household uh, like uh, expense? Household expenses. How, how what were they looking like? Were you really living a good life, okay life, or you were living a life uh, of somebody who has no job, a couple that has no job, so they will be very very tight with their expenses? Uh, would you be able to tell like how were you living? Yeah. Did it change your yeah, life I in any way? It went back and forth so many times that it. it so basically th this is also the, we're not like ostentatious people. We don't, we don't have, we have a, a car that's eight years old and we have no interest. We, we want to drive it into the ground. We don't buy fancy things. Um, I guess it's a, that's all relative. Uh, we, we are, we are in, in, in our community around us right now, people have a, a lot of keeping up with the Jones kind of stuff. They, it's a lot of people buying a lot of stuff, uh, you know, new cars, um, the, the, the nicest clothes, you know, d just different things that, that, that make it clear you care about what, you know, people think I have been wearing the same set of like five, $10 shirts from Amazon for the last year and a half. I, those are not the things that, that really drive value for me, which kind of goes back to what like money importance is to me. Um, but then we don't, we don't really associate things like eating out or groceries. Well, eating out more so, but but we don't associate or less so. We don't associate groceries with being a luxury. So so we cut out luxuries, but our 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 basic life. We didn't say no to basic life things. So we didn't. Um, 
we switched from Whole Foods to Trader Joe's. That's, you know, minimal. But that, yeah, that's, that's the that's best like, you could do, switching to Trader Joe's. No, 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 no. that's all. That, that's, that's not all. No, but I mean, I'm sure, don't you have well, some, like a little or something then, which is further down the they, <laughs> luxury they chain? Just opened, they just opened a little. And I, I went the last last week with my with my son and I, it was fantastic. And we will be shopping there every week from now okay. on. But, but hmm. I guess I, I should say is we, so there's, we didn't, we made like an active choice not to really adjust our lifestyle because we kept thinking it was temporary. Okay. And then once it turned out it wasn't temporary, we started adjusting our lifestyle, but realized we didn't really know what to pull back on. It wasn't, we didn't, we don't have a clothing. We, so we, we used to have, we used to allot ourselves, you know, a hundred bucks a month each to buy clothes. We got rid of that. We, we, we don't have like, we don't take Ubers. We don't, um, you know, there's a number of things that we do. we don't do like extraneous things, but we had a really hard time really adjusting our grocery shopping, you know, moving to your point, downgrading to Trader Joe's is, is it will save you 30 bucks a week, which is great. But what we didn't do a good job of is like changing the recipes we were making to, to have, you know, lower cost meals or bulk meal planning or, and what we really didn't do a good job of is when friends asked us to go get drinks or to go out to lunch or family wanted to visit or, or wanted us to come visit or you get invited to a wedding. We did not do a good job of adjusting those things because we didn't, we, I guess we weren't willing to. I Risk your friendship. You and have this. Exactly. Social. I don't care. I don't care about the material stuff, but I, I have a, such a hard time changing, risking friendships and not, not showing up for people. You know what I mean? I don't know. And it's a big consideration, whatever, like a lot of us. In fact, I made a video for my channel saying, uh, do, you, do you need to sort of sacrifice your friendship with, with certain friends who are spending? Is that the only way to save money? It's not, but I think that video, that's what I go into in that video. Uh, so I get your point, uh, right? But the fact remains that because you had access to this fund, that Right, and it it can, it could have been money saved in the bank, right? It's right like anything, but if you have access to something that makes both gives you comfort. So there are two ways to look at it. One is why why would we even save money, right? If you save some money or you have this equity, right, or in what we call as an emergency fund, it is actually for those times that when you have temporary problem in your life, you should still be able to live a good life or decent enough life. Right. So in, if you look from that perspective, you're doing the right thing, right? Because you earned that equity by working several years and you decided to use that during those lean times with that you had in your family, which is one way to look at it. Another way is that because uh, you that was sort of borrowed money, uh, it's advisable to cut down and try and minimize your expenses when times are uncertain, when you don't know how things will go. Uh, right. So tell me, what is the maximum that you took that line of liquidity to? Like how much, what is the maximum that you borrowed from there? I think we took, we had it at about 50K. 50K. Um, yeah. Well, and it's it's not that far away from there right now. Um, but okay. basically what happened is I, I was able to cobble together about $50,000 in, in real estate. Um, commissions. Earnings. Mm -hmm. Commissions. And... Then, so basically my, my salary before leaving was about $100,000, a little bit more. I was able to cobble together $50,000 and then we had $50,000 in debt. So that tells you exactly how little we changed our actual lifestyle is that we didn't change a single thing. And then and, we and thought that's, we were. That's, that's the problem I was referring to, right? That uh, That's yeah. a good way to look at it. And at least you are being transparent to recognize that. Uh, you borrowed as much as you needed to to maintain exactly, probably almost exactly the lifestyle that you're needing before you lost your jobs, right? Um, exactly. So that's something which 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 tells like you did not really uh, adjust your lifestyle, uh, right? And you laid up to fifty k. Uh, but I so that's something to think about. Probably should not have been done. But tell me this, you just mentioned that it's still around that amount, right? Still around that 50K, which was very, very interesting because don't you two have jobs now? Yes. Uh, I 
got a job in January of this year because she lost her job. So we, we went from having both of us working to one of us working to none of us working to one of us working again. So that's you or your wife? We were no longer one of now. I, and then that started starting January of 2023. I was the only one working. Okay. Um, and so while I had a good income, it was, um, it was still only one income. So we, we were, we were kind of in the exact same boat as we were in before, except my wife was, was full-time job hunting. She was not doing real estate. She wasn't making a little bit of money here and there. She was making no money. So it, 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 2023 was started our trajectory back in the right direction, back in the move of financial responsibility, but it was still slow to get there because then she didn't get her job until, and also I, sh I should caveat that when I say like we didn't change our lifestyle, we also are, we're still learning how to, how to operate with a toddler. And a lot of times you go, Oh, we should go get groceries right now and we should cook and we should do this and that, but you're exhausted and you know that you could door dash dinner in 20 minutes. And there was a lot of that kind of stuff. It was, it was a lot of like, App, absolute exhaustion leads to bad decision making kind of stuff in the in the little money money section but so in may of this year she got another job so that was still another five months of like december in december we neither of us had jobs and then january to may only i had a job and then in may now we're both working again and the thing you mentioned about the irs because last year was so tough on a day-to-day month to month perspective, I didn't set aside any money for taxes on purpose. I, I I knew, I knew exactly what I was doing. I wasn't like, Oh my God, taxes. I just, I knew that I needed that money to pay my mortgage and my credit card bill. And so I made a concerted decision to not set that money aside. So now we are on a payment plan with the IRS to pay those taxes. They are not back taxes. They're not delayed. We are well within the, there's no, nobody's coming after us. And you're not paying a lot of back, interest. So uh, the 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 good thing is that you're saying that you went into this with open eyes. You know what you owe and you have a plan for it, which is good. It yeah. still doesn't take anything away from the fact that you made this decision of not paying taxes or not setting money aside for taxes. Uh, it may work out for you because like you said, you got a job, your wife got, got a job. Great. But again, in general, as a principal, and for everyone is listening and seeing this, it's a very, very risky move where you take a call yeah. that I will not pay taxes. There are other priorities in life. Uh, the fact is that everyone has uh, priorities, difficulties in life all the time. We all can use an extra ten, twenty thousand dollars all the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's just a fact. So for anyone who is self-employed doing a commission kind of business like you, it's absolutely important to set aside the tax amount uh, and just deal with it. There is no other way to. That money was never yours because taxes are reality of life. So that money was never yours and you have to keep that money aside. I really hope that you will not repeat that because like I said, it's, it's very, very risky. Imagine if for some reason you or your wife, you did not have a job now then you have this 50k in line of liquidity that you have to pay back and some other bills and mortgage etc and you, you would have irs coming after you that's a scary scary situation to be in so i really yeah. hope that you come out of it but something you took a big risk that is for sure and i i agree i highly recommend or or i i, I think it's imperative and and extremely necessary to set that money aside I mean, it's the same thing of like, if you want to save money, don't save it at the end of your paycheck, save it at the beginning of your paycheck. True, very true. Because you will spend it. Yeah. So tell me this, uh, now both you and your wife are working, uh, what is your annual income taken together in the ballpark? Together, ballpark with commissions, because I, I were in a sales role, it would be right around 225, uh, could be slightly higher, could be slightly lower. So let let um, it be 225, uh, just for our argument's sake. So. If you are making 225 uh, this year or from now onwards, right? And you have lived your life in about 100K annual income, right? For last couple of years. So do you think at the first order of business, do you think in a period of one year, preferably earlier, you'd be able to completely 
pay back the 50,000 that you have on your line of liquidity? Yeah, we're down to 40 now, uh, which is still too close to 50, that for sure. Um, but but yeah, that's our, our goal and our number one priority is to pay that off. So we have, uh, we're putting roughly 2,000 towards it every month. Um, which is, sounds take, like it should be easy. Yeah, I, I know. Like more than a year. Yeah, 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 more but, than a year. So you probably need to, but I get, you um, probably need to do better. It may be a tough few more months. Like you may not start enjoying yeah. one of the jobs for say next six months, but the recommendation would be as a family do that. One, it will bring a lot of discipline. And the second thing, which is more important, I'll tell you uh, something for you to chew on and discuss with your wife as well. Say you decide somehow you are able to manage Four thousand a month, just for argument's sake, between both of your jobs, you are able to put four thousand a month towards it. Then, uh, very soon, right? I don't know, like in ten months, this will be completely done. One, yeah, uh, and then it is doable because of your income. So one, you this will be completely off your chest, and 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 you don't have to worry about it any longer. The sooner you do it, better it is because life has a habit of throwing surprises. So if you elongate it, something else, some other priority may come. That's one. But second, right. which is even more important is you will learn to do live without that 4,000, right? Which you are putting towards this. So after 10 months, now you have 4,000, which you guys can put towards investment, towards your child's future, towards your own future without batting an eyelid. You don't have to think from where this will come, like for my child's yeah. college, or for, right? So you'll make a habit because now you have to pay it. But after 10 months, this will become... Uh, if somebody, a couple is putting 10, 4,000 a month into savings and investment, then you will see that your future will start looking very bright, very quickly. So consider both and see if you can hasten that uh, paying payback plan. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think it's a great idea. And, and we, we are, uh, we're planning to, to up, up that number. Great. Great. Awesome. Uh, so, but you do have a mortgage you uh, told me about, which is, uh, I, I can assume the time when you took the mortgage, it's, it would be, have great interest rates. So retain your mortgage, right? Uh, there is no need to pay back that mortgage unless it, it really bothers you, right? Uh, but uh, your car is an older car, but do you have an auto loan as well? Yeah, we have a $300 a month. It's a pretty low rate as well. We got it like February of 2019, I think. Uh, that is almost paid off. So once that's paid off, that's an additional 300 a month that we can put towards the like uh, the equity line. Awesome, awesome. So so that's great. Looks like uh, you you have the right income at this point to help build a good good life, uh, provided of course uh, you retain your job, continue with your job. So I have some questions that yes. questions <laughs> questions wood. around that. I'm sure your <laughs> wife is wondering too. What happens after six months to a yeah. year? <laughs> right. Right. No, no. I I am that's why my mindset is flipped. I no longer I, I I no longer am trying to reach in a career that is not um in a way that's not feasible for me. I am very comfortable in the job I'm doing right now and I plan on staying here for a very long time because it it's it's a good job, it pays well, it's enjoyable, and I'm also doing the things outside of work that make me happy. So I'm not constantly itching for what's next. I'm I'm getting the facility I need, and I'm also you know doing the thing I need to do that's responsible. That's perfect. Yeah. I think that that would have been my suggestion. Uh, it looks like you're already on that path. That nowadays, because uh, there are so many options and avenues available where you can scratch that itch that you have, right, and do some other things on the side, be it your real estate, be it your acting gigs, and so many other things, without necessarily fully quitting your job that you have, which provides stability to your family. Completely. So if you have found that balance or at least thought about how you can do maintain that balance, that's great. That would be the suggestion. But tell me this, uh, what was the period during which you stayed without a job purposefully? Like you did not actively look for a job, right? Because for it's different for you and your wife. I understand that she lost a job and she was actively seeking a job. But for you, you took a call, right? You told your boss, I don't need, you don't need to plan my career, right? So it was, it was from February, February 4th, 2022, 2022 was my last day at my previous job. In November of 2022, the end of November, my wife got, found out her company was, was going away. 
So from the end of November, so from that from February to November, I was I was I wasn't actively not looking for a job. I was actively working in real estate and doing and doing that stuff. But starting in no at the end of November, I started looking for a job. And by mid December I had signed an offer and January second I started so my new job. About a year, right? Give or take about a year. Uh, so yeah. it, it's very interesting and important, and I appreciate you, uh, uh, like transparently sharing this with me and uh, with others who'll be watching. See, ma- there are many of us who go through the same cycle in a job which may not, which may be paying okay, but may not be very fulfilling, and we have our eyes on other things. What else can be done? You have at least taken those steps, right? Majority will just think about it; they'll not take an action, right? And unless you take an action, you won't even know whether it was going to work out for you or not, right? So at least you have the satisfaction of taking that action. You have given yourself some time, gone through that, and whatever decision you made, finally you are somewhere, right? So two two questions, right? Would one, would you recommend to others as well that maybe uh, be a slightly more prudent, or or, or um, maybe think about your safety net a little better, but give it a shot uh, would you recommend that or would you say that it was too risky uh, don't do it i i fully believe i'm the i'm the evolved person that i am today because i i made that choice i i think i would recommend having a little bit more of a safety net also making sure that your partner or other people that are that are, are directly impacted by your decisions making sure that they are bought in that, that they they understand what's going on and not to make unilateral decisions when you're not in a solo situation. Um, but th- that all being said, the interpersonal stuff is is if for for my me to figure out with with my wife about why it was not really the right thing to do it, for for me to do that on my own. But from just an intrinsic perspective, I learned so much, and now I think I am way better prepared to be both the person and the partner that that my family needs moving forward because I understand what makes me tick. I understand what my limits are. I understand how hard it is to make a dollar when someone's not writing a check to you every single week. And I I really am am am, am capturing the the gravity of of what are the important things in life and and how money plays into those things. And so I feel like I have I have gotten a, a PhD in the last year in 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 kind of real life isn't necessarily exactly what you what you wish it was, but it still can create opportunities for you to be to be the caregiver, to be the partner, to be the dad, and be the person internally that that you want to be. And and I would not be there if I hadn't so taken nicely that put. Week. That's what they they call Thank school you. of hard knocks, right? So. Sometimes yeah. you get knocked down, but you learn a lot. And that's what you're saying. That exactly. The outcome yeah. may not be financially what you wished for, but you have grown as a person. And just the mere fact that you feel more grounded in terms of how you lead your career going forward is a win, right? And I'm sure uh, that will be a big relief to your loved ones, your wife and others, right? That now you have a much, uh, you are much more stable and clear-headed about what you want to do, what how your career is pro- going to progress. So that's great. That's something for everyone to consider. That give it a shot, maybe a bit, bit more careful. But that experience may actually uh, tell you, right? Frankly, either either you do what you want, or at least you know that I have tried. You have that satisfaction. I've tried everything, and now I know this is, this is the right path for me. That's great. Now, exactly. Uh, second thing is that when you quit. You had certain idea that uh, you will start making two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars through real estate and become an actor on the side and all that. Uh, that did not pan out completely. Maybe, like you said, you have a plan in God. So, what was that feeling like? At what point you realized that it's not necessarily going as per my plan, and I need to do some rethink? I I think there was, it was kind of tough because it it you expect it to kind of start off slow. And then around the summer, late summer, I started getting a ton of traction. And I had I had over a million dollars in sales in October of 2022. Closed, closed so, beans or in pipeline? 
closed deals. I had four closings in October. If you include September, there were five, maybe six. So it was like nearly 2 million in sales in this short period of time. And I was like, oh, I can do this. This is fantastic. If, if you, if I did that 10 times, I would have made 200, 200 grand that year. If I had every, every month was October. I would have, or, or if, if 10 out of 12 months were October, I would have made 200 grand. So I was like, this is possible. I could do this. It's not completely out of the question. But what happened is on November 1st, I realized my pipeline was empty because I'd spent the last eight weeks making sure those deals happened. And I realized how much effort it takes and how much energy and how many calls and how many conversations and how many showings and how much time in the car it takes to keep your pipeline at that level consistently. Because I, I knew that it was possible because I, I knew I had the skill set to, to do the business, but I realized I it was going to take a whole, it would also, there was a lot of luck when, when you're a rookie and you have over it's you know, a million and a half luck. sales. It's called being missed luck. <laughs> yeah. In most of the things, most exactly. of the professions, most of the things, and frankly, even gambling, you tend to win when you start. <laughs> exactly. So there, there was, it was this realization that after I'd made the most, you know, 20K in, in one month that I was like, oh, this is actually not, it's not going to happen it, because that was such an incredible, lucky situation that would be so, so challenging, not impossible, but so challenging to replicate that it is not going to happen for me. Um, and then a couple weeks later, my wife gets laid off and I was like, well, this is a good kind of kick in the pants. You tried, but uh, what's important now is health insurance. And so it was, it was, no more cold calling for me. It was just so, trying to so get a job. So I'll ask you a, a frank question, and I hope you'll answer it uh, truthfully like you have been doing. Uh, do you think that it was based on that, what you just said, all those realizations that your pipeline is drying up and all, or uh, it was more the fear of like your wife losing job and health insurance? So do you still feel in your heart that you made a good try and it didn't work out or at some point that fear overtook you and uh, sometimes you still think that maybe <laughs> there was a way for me to build back the pipeline. Well, so I guess transparently there's like three, there's three, three factors there. Like number one, I, before I knew that she was getting laid, that her job was ending, I very much thought I, I could do this, but it would be so challenging. This is the pipeline's not there. I have to restart from scratch. I'm not going to have a good month until February because the holidays, blah, 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 blah. So it's very much acutely in that couple of weeks, it was right there. I was like, all right, this is going to be a grind if I'm going to keep doing it. Then very quickly, the fear set in where this was not an option to be, you know, skeptical about my business acumen. It was just, it was a reality that there was fear. The third thing that was happening was that I was so optimistic that I was going to work well with my brother-in-law and it just, it just wasn't, it didn't click as much as I thought it would. We were great friends working together, did not really work out as well as I thought just interpersonal. So there was also that added layer where I was perhaps searching for a reason to leave. I understand. And then that is also, again, a reality of life that, um, doing business or interacting in a professional environment with family and friends is often challenging. More often than not, it's actually challenging Hello? because it brings very different dynamics yeah. into the play. Expectations are different. So um, I, it is good. It's, it's very, very challenging unless uh, there is a very clear understanding or acceptance of uh, how the dynamics are going to work. Right. So I, I can yeah. sort of relate to that. There have been many stories where, where that happened. So, okay. I understand. So, Everything taken together, you have made this call. Now you both have good jobs. And we already discussed about how you should be focusing on paying down all your debt, particularly the light of credit that you have. Post that, you should be looking at investing your money. But while that happens, do you have any investments? Are you guys already looking at or have done any investments? What is it, How are you looking at saving money for future or planning your future around that? I mean, the goal is to get back to that. Right now, we're trying to just reduce reduce debts. Uh, I mean, we, we might end up moving sometime soon, at which point 
whether we rent somewhere or whether we buy something, we're planning on retaining this condo because it's our rate is really low. It's in a fantastic rental area. So that will turn into an investment uh, if that happens, which will which will cash flow positive right away, which will go directly towards pay. Okay, yeah. that that would be a good idea. Like if you do that again with with the, with properties, if you stay in them and then sort of move, either sell or make them rental, either way. It, it, it's a good idea because uh, you probably know this uh, or if not, I'll tell you that even if you were to sell the property, right? If you have stayed in the property for uh, more than two years as your primary home, right? In the last five years, then any gains that you will have, you don't have to pay any taxes on that up to a certain amount. Right. So you can actually make real gains, realize them on paper and then put that money towards anything else because, you know, Without yeah. paying and then, then possibly do it again. So because these are this is one of the very few ways in which you can actually earn a profit and not share it with Uncle Sam. It's it's legal, right? So I didn't. Yeah, I didn't that's know something that. that's for you to, to explore know. when you kind of weigh your option whether you want a rental or you want to actually take out that money and like it's it's money without any tax basis and then you make any new investment, right? So you basically get to yeah. realize those gains. If, if a family is flexible and it's typically possible only when you are either single or you have a very small kid, but if you have that flexibility, uh, that's one way to make money from real estate by being able to move and like that you either sell or you make an investment property. So that's one suggestion for you to look at, definitely. Another point I wanted to quickly check or leave this thought with you. Do you guys, both your wife and you have insurance, life insurance? Oh, we do, yeah. Well, once we got pregnant, we both took out life insurance okay. policies. So that that's smart of you. Uh, that's something which should should be done with a kid involved. Uh, life is uncertain, as we all know. So I'm I'm glad that you have that. So I I think broadly speaking, those are the two things you have to look at. First, focus on paying down your debt, and then, in fact, see if you can do it something in the first year itself, so that it becomes a habit in terms of saving regularly and investing regularly. And once you have that debt paid off. Then you put start putting more money. What you should uh, towards investment. What you yeah. should avoid is uh, doing anything again uh, where you feel like let me not pay down my debt, but here is a great investment opportunity, uh, or like a friend is telling is. me this situation, <laughs> let me invest here because then this debt will always be hanging on your head, right? So because we all see those situations like you did with the taxes, so I'm just cautioning you be very careful. I'm pretty sure there will be temptations along the way. And that's another reason I'm recommending that Always. don't extend the debt. Pay it off as quickly as possible and so that then you can, yeah. with a free mind, you can decide what you want to do with your money. Perfect. Any other Absolutely. Uh, question, Max, that you have for me? Anything that I can help with? No, I think you've been super helpful. It's, it's you know, it's it's quite a complex, challenging situation, both financially, you know, emotionally, interpersonally. Uh, and so it's really helpful to have someone to talk to to be able to kind of parse out even some of my funny stories into like, well, this is a good lesson. You shouldn't have done that. This is a good way path forward. So I, I really appreciate it. Excellent. You're welcome. And I appreciate you transparently sharing this with me uh, and, and and with others. Like I said right in the beginning, the goal of the podcast is that others get to hear and maybe make some better informed choices for their own financial life. That's the goal. Uh, but talking Absolutely. to you, I can clearly see uh, that uh, the confidence that you have in terms of thinking that you can make a lot of things work is not without basis. You are a dynamic, confident individual. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you will do well in most of the jobs which require interpersonal skills or sales. And those are the things which actually uh, earn money, frankly speaking. So in my opinion, you uh, I, we did not go deep into what you're doing now, but in my opinion, you still need to find the right balance in terms of a job that can really let you use your skill. And I think you did mention that there is commission involved. And for somebody like you, I will strongly recommend that you do a job that involves commission where there is a lot of upside possible if you are willing to hustle and willing to do your job because somebody like you will do it is more likely to succeed in such job. So if you have found a job like that, that's great. Otherwise, kind of keep trying that. And again, this is for everyone else. If your personality no, is like Max, Go for a commission-based job. <laughs> oh, oh th thank you. I, I thank you so much for having me on. It's really great to to be here.